Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Georgina Downer and I'm the host of Afternoon Light. Each week I speak to leading thinkers from around the world about Robert Menzies, his life, his era and his enduring legacy. Hello and on today's episode of Afternoon Light, I'm joined by Dr. Meg Gurry, who is a fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and an academic fellow at the Australia India Institute. And Meg is also the author of Australia and India, Mapping the Journey 1944 to 2014, and we're going to talk today about the history of Australia-India relations. So welcome to Afternoon Light, Meg. Thank you, Georgina. Well, it's great to have you here at the Robert Menzies Institute and an extraordinary evolution this relationship has gone through in reading your book, those early days post-independence for India. It was a different relationship. And of course, Australia was a very different country then, as was India. So really interesting study into this incredibly important bilateral relationship. Thank you. I love those early chapters when I got into the archives and found all the letters from the first guy, I think Colin Moody was one of them who left an unpublished memoir. And then there was Ivan Mackay. And these are Australian diplomats. Australian diplomats. In This was in the 40s. Australia opened its first mission in India in 1944. Right. So it's still a colony. It's still part of the British Empire. And we were most unusual, but there were not many countries that did that. But we did. And it wasn't the first, but it was about sixth or seventh in line of our diplomatic missions throughout the world. And they arrived with nothing. Yeah. They took their own knives and forks and cutlery. And, of course, 1944, the war was still on. So it was really pretty out there. And anyway, it's just been fascinating to record the progression from those early days of dusty streets and fairly difficult living conditions. Yes, it does sound in your book you describe it, the conditions for the first diplomats who went in the early 40s, mid-40s and They didn't have a great time, did they? But then things improved. (laughs) It was difficult. And then they had to go back to Canberra and that was fascinating too to see how small what was then DEA actually was, was just a few men and a dog. Yes, Department of External Affairs. So it was about 12 people, I think, originally. It was nothing. It was in a few (laughs) rooms, I can't, in the West Block, I think it was called. It was the East Block, one of those. So it all sort of, yeah, it was fascinating for me to start at the beginning at least. And obviously, I'm very interested to talk about India and Menzies and Nehru particularly, but the Menzies Chifley story is really interesting. So Nehru comes the first Prime Minister of independent India in 1947 and Ben Chifley is Prime Minister of Australia, having taken over from John Curtin who died in office. And they were quite close, weren't they? They had a bit of a meeting of the minds. They did. Yeah. Which, like a lot of things about Nehru, it would be hard to have predicted that. Mm. He and Chifley actually got on extremely well. And I think Chifley was a kind of like he looked, this sort of avuncular, affable guy with his pipe, and he didn't want to rock too many boats. But he was not a weak man by any stretch of the imagination. He had very strong views, and he actually really believed that India was going to play a huge role in the post-war and post-colonial, though I'm not sure that term was used then, world. So he and Nehru, they met at Prime Minister's conference meetings in London and Chifley was very involved in 1949, just before Menzies took office in India, staying in the Commonwealth as a republic. So Chifley was very involved in the work that went towards that formula because it was very difficult because India did not want to have a king, (laughs) certainly not a British king, but they could see some benefits from staying in the Commonwealth and they're still there now. Yeah. It was just interesting the way Chifley and Nehru, and apparently they had a breakfast at Claridge's before the Prime Minister's conference meeting began and there was just Chifley, Nehru, and unfortunately one of Nehru's advisors and not one of Australian advisors. So there is no record of this meeting. Oh, right. No, no official record. Nehru's advisor didn't keep a record? No, well, or... not that I've been able to find. Right, right. But Chifley and Everett differed on India's incorporation into the Commonwealth, didn't they, as a republic? Yes. In true Everett style, tried to get a lot of glory for that. But in actual fact, was it Frank Bongiorno or was an Australian academic who wrote a paper about this and said it was actually not Everett. Everett actually wanted India to stay. Everett was a little bit more conservative than he appeared in many ways. 
And he wanted India to stay as a constitutional monarchy, which, of course, India was never going to do. Chifley had allowed Evert to run with a lot of foreign policy stuff because mm. of Evert's background. But Chifley took over this one. He took over devising the formula that allowed India to stay in the Republic. And why do you think that was? Was that because of Chifley's relationship with Nehru? Or? I think so. Right. I think so. And I think it was this breakfast at Claridge's. Nehru's advisor, whose name I can't remember, went on and wrote a book about Nehru and included this in it. And after Chifley died, because he died suddenly in 1951, Nehru was interviewed and Nehru said, oh, I remember well our breakfast at Claridge's the morning of the Prime Minister's conference. And then he said when Chifley played a big role in devising the way of words, the formula for keeping India in the Commonwealth. So they got on very well. And that's what makes the whole menzies Nehru thing somewhat mysterious that they didn't get on well. Yes. Because it wasn't as if Nehru was intrinsically difficult to get on with. Yeah. Because the train driver from Perth sort of established a rapport. Yeah, so Nehru, so you're saying Nehru wasn't particularly anti-Australian in that he was able to... Not at that stage. ...to have a strong relationship yes. with an Australian leader in Ben Chifley, but there was something in the differences of Nehru and Menzies' worldviews that led them to have a yes. very, very strained relationship. And the strange thing about that is that all of them, perhaps not strange, but the unpredictable thing about that was that Nehru was the one that had been to Harrow, to Cambridge, he did law in London, he got his law training in London, spoke English beautifully and was... The ex- King's English yes, at the time. extremely yeah. eloquent and a writer, yes. writer in his own right, yeah. not necessarily just writing because he was important. And there was somebody, it was an Australian academic who I think might have been David Goldsworthy, who said one of the things that annoyed Menzies most about Nehru was that he spoke English better than Menzies did. Ah. <laughs> so, I don't know whether that's true or not, but that was one of those stories. Bit of speculation. When, yes, when people were looking around for reasons. Nehru's Prime Minister of India, the first Prime Minister from 47 until his death in 64, Menzies Prime Minister of Australia second time around from 49 to 66. So they're basically leaders of their countries for exactly the same period. And long period. And a long period. And iconic leaders too. Mm. You know, they're defining their nations yep. in their own ways. So tell me about Nehru's worldview because that's important when you consider how different it was from Robert Menzies. Well, Nehru was proudly Indian, proudly wanting India to chart its own course in the world, very, very committed to the British system of parliamentary democracy. They'd been left secular, very much a secular Democrat, which is interesting too. There's a lot of talk about non-alignment and it is absolutely true that Nehru wanted a non-aligned foreign policy. But I think what gets a little lost, and I think it got lost in Menzies' mind, was that non-alignment wasn't communist. It was actually Nehru trying to chart a middle course. And he did believe in the Soviet model of five-year plans and running the economy in that way. He certainly believed in closing off the economy. I mean, he was not economic or taki. So that was always going to be a problem for Australia and India. But in terms of his worldview, he put an enormous amount of faith in China, in being good neighbours with China, which of course was absolutely blown apart in 1962 when China invaded India along the Somalia border. And that was terribly difficult for Nehru. In fact, a lot of people think he never recovered from that. He died two years later. So there were a lot of overlaps with Menzies, particularly in the commitment to parliamentary democracy, a secularism. Nehru did not want partition. He was bitterly opposed to partition. But in the end, he was persuaded, possibly by the Brits, that he had to give in to what Jinnah was asking for within partition. And he was very upset about that, extremely upset. So his worldview was very much to chart a path for India that was beholden to nobody Nobody. He didn't want anything to do with Eastern blocks or Western blocks, or that's where the non alignment thing came from. And he was also very pro Asian. There was two conferences held in India, one in 1947, one in 1949. And Australia sent representatives to both government representatives to the first and what we would now call NGO representatives to the second. And they were organised by Nehru and they were all about creating kind of pan-Asian, this is, Asia's going to go forward and we don't need to be told. But it was post-colonial. It was Mm. like colonisation is dead, done, we're all working, particularly in India. But all the other countries, African countries, Asian countries are now working towards charting out a path of independence. And somewhere in that mix, 
he and Menzies fell down? Well, indeed. So Menzies is obviously very focused on the Cold War and Australia falls on the side of the United States, Mm -hmm. on the Western side, on the side of liberal democracies. And he's very committed to Australia as a large landmass but small in population and economically quite small too and geographically distant, needing great and powerful friends. And, of course, that's inimical to Nehru's worldview. Mm. And that issue of the US alliance becomes a major problem, intractable, isn't it, between Menzies and Nehru, that Nehru sees Australia as the US's stooge. and Well, from 49, when Menzies came in, 49 to 66 with Australia and India, there were two overarching themes. So one was the decolonising world as all of the countries of Asia and many countries in Africa getting their independence. And then at the same time as that, we had the white Australia policy. So we can talk about that in a minute. So Australia had built up these walls, colour walls, race walls, to keep out anybody who wasn't white. And then at the same time as that, Australia was pursuing a great and powerful friend's security policy. Mm. And it was really problematic because on both counts, those two major issues, the racially discriminatory immigration policy and the pursuit of great and powerful friends, there was sort of no room in there for Asia and in this case in, for India. So there was, there was no way that India could slot into that. And Menzies there were some Asian initiatives taken during that time. There was Colombo Plan, there was the Japanese Trade Treaty of 57, the CETO of 54, but they were really about securing American protection or, in CETO's case, British protection as well, and that sort of then all led into the Vietnam War. So there was no way that Menzies was standing out saying... I mean, he never tried to explain his position on the racially, on the white Australia policy except privately, when he said, well, we're just trying to avoid the problems of the United States and South Africa and Britain. Meg, could I ask you why Menzies' position on white Australia, which wasn't really a strong defence of it, it was just it is as it is, and he did start to dismantle it from 1958. It really started to be quite seriously dismantled. But why was that an issue for Nehru when it came to Menzies' not necessarily an issue when it came to Ben Chifley, who was equally a supporter of White Australia. I mean, White Australia was, let's not get this wrong, White Australia was completely Mm. bipartisan up until really the 60s. So it's not a problem for Chifley. Was Nehru focused on Chifley's role? Well, interestingly, Nehru, he never brought it up himself. He never brought it up in Parliament. He never brought it up with the diplomats, which was interesting because he could have, but he didn't. So he tended to leave that to one side. But it was his people around him and his senior officials and particularly the press that would go on and on and on about the white Australia policy. So much so that I was even in India in 2012 when I was researching this book and I spoke to a lot of senior India officials and one of them just took me to task, which I sort of hadn't seen coming. So sort of sitting a bit like you and I are sitting now. And so the memories lingered. Mm lingered about the white Australia. It was deeply offensive. That's a good question. Chifley spoke with a very inclusive idiom and language about India in the post-war world. And maybe Nehru was just prepared to let the white Australia policy slip under the carpet in terms of Nehru's concern because he liked what Chifley was saying. But when Menzies came in and Menzies coupled a racially discriminatory immigration policy with all this rhetoric about the great and powerful friends and whatever. There were two issues. One was the white Australia policy for Menzies and India. The other was we were seen as an American stooge was the word that I think Nehru might have used or somebody used. No, maybe it was maybe it was one of our high commissioners, Walter Crocker. Australia is seen as an American stooge. And that was really, really annoyed a lot of very, very senior Indians. And Nehru, it annoyed him too. He wasn't a big fan of the United States. So it wasn't the sense that Menzies was an Anglophile and Nehru was not, I mean, he'd been imprisoned mm. by the British. Mm. So he, he certainly had varying degrees of antipathy to yes. Britain. So was it, it wasn't more about the British connection. It was about this US connection and Australia was... It was of- both. It was both. I mean, these days it would be called 
he had a sort of antipathy towards the Anglosphere. Yes. So that term wasn't used then. No. Probably the best way to explain it is it all came to a head in 1960-61 when South Africa was asked to leave or was booted out or, in fact, I think in the end they might have chosen to leave, but the Commonwealth of Nations. And there were two very heated meetings in London that Macmillan chaired, Harold Macmillan chaired, and Menzies was there, Nehru was there. And they fought bitterly, Menzies and Nehru, over whether South Africa should be allowed to stay. And Menzies argued very strongly, and I've seen some of the private communication between him and Macmillan, about apartheid, we all need to make political judgments about which good and decent men can differ. So he saw it as just an opinion. You can either be for apartheid or put against apartheid. For Nehru, apartheid was just this deep, passionate, moral, he would never, ever let it go. And Menzi was told that. And so they had to have this consensus around the table. And Nehru said, well, South Africa can't stay. So Menzi's actually said to Macmillan and to, he went from there to the United States and he, I think it was to Eisenhower, he said to someone, of course, if we let them throw South Africa out, on racial grounds or grounds of racial policy, we'll be next. With mm. that. And he actually said, with our racially discriminatory policy, he used those terms. And he said, so we can't, we can't allow this to happen. So he was being quite pragmatic in some ways. Yeah. And he didn't want to see the Commonwealth pull, fall no, apart No, he loved either. the Commonwealth. So but, losing a member. But he didn't want to see it fall apart. And he particularly didn't want to see South Africa go. Because even though South Africa had something like 75% blacks, Menzies in a way didn't see them. Menzies talked about Australia, Britain, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa as one ancestry, one race. So ignoring the sort of 75% of blacks who were there. Yeah. And so South Africa to him was part of the inner sanctum. I mean, it was part of one of the self-governing mm. dominions from 1931 statute of Winston, Westminster, I suppose. So Menzies never really, he never really understood and Nehru knew this. I don't think Menzies ever understood the legacy of empire. He never understood the brutality of colonisation. To me, that's the nub of the problem with him and Nehru. For Nehru, colonisation was humiliating, it was immoral, should never have happened. And Menzies had these strange little comments. Menzies landed in India in 1950, and when he got off the boat or the plane, he was met by a group of reporters and visiting dignitaries. And he said, you know, it's wonderful to be here. This is when he met now. He said, wonderful to be here. He said, Australia is a British country. That was his opening line. I was thinking, this is three years after the British have just left and there's been partition and terrible, terrible, for which the British were blamed a lot of the time. And then he went on to say that I too, I don't know whether it was in this speech, but it was in that visit. He said, I too am a colonial. He said, I was born in the colony of Victoria in 1894. Mm. And two days later, he said, when I walked through the Parliament House in New Delhi, I felt instantly at home. And then he said, isn't it wonderful that all the things that we've been left in Australia, you've been left in India? Yeah. And then he went and gave an interview with the Times and he said, I won't have a bar of this. I'm not sure this was a 1950 visit. It might have been because he went every two years. He said, I won't have a bar of this that Britain should feel any shame for what it's done with India and other countries. He said, they've left behind a wonderful legacy and da 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 So he never got the sheer awfulness of colonisation and what people felt and, and yeah. the humiliation. So it seems like Menzies was idolising the experience of colonialism that looking at all the good that British colonialism yes. had given and British Empire had given Australia through English language, Westminster system yes, of he government, all them the institutions. Yeah. So he looked at those as, well, they were a force for good and they're a great legacy, whereas Nehru is looking at, is sort of demonising the colonial mm. experience and looking at all the negatives. Mm. There's probably somewhere in between in the truth of the matter, but they, they couldn't were find polar it. opposites. And it all came to a head in 60 and 61. And in the end, South Africa left. And Menzies is on record as saying how he uses language like distraught and bitterly disappointed. And also he said, I'm not happy with all these new boys from Africa coming into the Commonwealth and changing it. He said, what was once a precious family association is now a loose association of nations that have no links to each other other than the fact that they were once colonised by the British. So he loses faith in the Commonwealth after 60 and 61. And in a way, if there was ever a chance of Nehru and Menzies warming towards each other as they got older, it was 60 and 61 that made that absolutely impossible. Yeah, yeah. 
I wonder too, Meg, if – and sorry, back to Chief Lee and how that was such a different relationship with Menzies. It was also their kind of way of conceiving of how to – run their own countries too. I mean, Chifley was obviously much more into central planning like Nehru was. You know, his policies were, I mean, Menzies would have said they were, you know, socialist policies yep. and he was. He was yep. a socialist yep. as was Nehru. So there would have been a meeting of a minds whether they necessarily discuss domestic issues or not, you know, but there would have been a meeting of the minds of how you conceive of running your country whereas Menzies was completely opposed to the socialist agenda and was much more about the individual and private enterprise and creating, they would have said, create little capitalists and amongst Australians. Yeah, there was society. no meeting of the minds. I no think. meeting of the minds. So, again, they're coming at their positions from absolute opposite ends. And there was somehow a personality breakdown as well because Menzies visited India a few times, well, not many, but one of them was 1959. And Walter Crocker, who was then Australia's High Commissioner to India, left behind very detailed diaries about that visit. And Menzies apparently was quite pleased and said, oh, I think we got on much better this time. Then he said Nehru was a much more relaxed man than usual. And then he said this strange thing. He said, I would have liked to have called him by his first name, but I don't know what it is. Oh. <laughs> he said that to Crocker. Now, I think that's because Menzies probably couldn't pronounce Jahawal, like I know that, Jahawal with an L, two Ls. And it was sort of shocking that this was 1959. They'd been, Menzies came in in 49, so they'd met every 18 months at these Prime Minister's conferences that went for 10 days, these conferences. I mean, they're unheard of now. Yeah. <laughs> they went down to Checkers and they all went off for the weekend <laughs> and had lunches and breakfasts and dinners. He said, I would have liked to call him, he said Christian name, but it's Christian name, but I don't know what it is. And then Crocker then wrote in his diary, Menzies thinks the visit went very well. I'm not so sure. Menzies loves to sit and be a raconteur mm. and he said, and just tell funny anecdotes and he said, Nehru is not a conversationalist in that way and he said, Nehru just sat there looking bored the whole time. So I think even when Menzies was rather pleased with the contact, it probably wasn't quite as good as well. Nara wasn't similarly pleased. No, and no. Nara would never wasn't mutual. <laughs> Nara would never ever let the whole kinship thing and blood thing. One thing about Nara, he refused ever to acknowledge that the British had done anything for India, and yeah. he had no sentimentality about empire. Whereas a lot of Menzies' stuff was sentimental. I feel looking from his writings, a lot of it was, you know, all the stuff about the ancestry of our race. Couldn't decide whether to say we're sister nations or brother nations a couple of times. And interestingly, I thought it was fascinating the fact that Menzies' interest was far more in the British than in the European. Mm. So Menzies apparently very rarely coupled or combined any of his visits to England with popping over to France or Germany or I'm not the full bottle on this, but that's what I've been told. And that he actually liked to say that Australia was a British nation he said that more than a white nation, but that meant white. But it was actually your grandfather, Georgina, who when he was Minister for Immigration in the Menzies government, and he left behind either some notes or a book, I can't remember, you would know probably. And he said something like, Menzies gave me my head, allowed me to do what I wanted in immigration. He said, however, there would be growls of disapproval from Menzies. <laughs> this is your grandfather's book. Growls of disapproval because of the stream of Italians and Greeks who were coming into Australia. So this was the big sort of migration. Yes, in the 50s. Yes, yeah, so the Italians yeah. and Greeks. And he said there would be growls of disapproval about the Italians and Greeks. And then I don't think Dander said this, but somebody then wrote in the book that I was reading, so Menzies wanted immigrants to be not only white but British they were not meant to be Italian and Greek. And then uh, your grandfather also said settlers from Asia were even less welcome. So, I mean, there's no doubt about the Asia thing, and which Nehru would have picked up. For some reason, Menzies was uncomfortable in Asia or with Asian people. And so many of his colleagues, and particularly the diplomats, but not only the diplomats, his colleagues as well, said well, things like not comfortable with Asian people. And when I remember there's a lovely story that when Keith Shan, who was Australia's High Commissioner to Indonesia and other places, wonderful man. If I had my time again, I'd like to have written a biography of Keith Shan. 
when he was appointed ambassador to Indonesia in the early 60s, he did the visit you have to do to the Prime Minister and he went to see Menzies. And Menzies sort of was farewelling him and said, well, Keith, he said, don't have any fears that you're going to get a prime ministerial visit when you're there. He said, I never want to go near the place again. <laughs> So Menzies did not have good memories about his visits to Asia. In fact, one of his people who wrote about him, Alan Watt, who was head of foreign affairs in the early 50s, Alan Watt said Menzies just could not cope with the climate right. and the massive heat and all the fanfare that goes with it. And he had to well, when you're wearing a double-breasted suit, yeah. it would be quite uncomfortable, yes. I can imagine. And they said that was quite significant. But Menzies is able to, when it comes to Japan, Overlook mm. being enemies during World War II. Obviously, Australia really engaged in a pretty ferocious battle with the Japanese through the Pacific War, the bombing of Darwin, some Japanese subs in Sydney Harbour, obviously the fall of Singapore. Many Australians experienced atrocities as six prisoners of war in Changi and Sandakan and Burma Railway. So it's a very tricky relationship with Japan, but Menzies is able to overcome that and you have the peace treaty with Japan, which leads to ANZUS, and then you have, of course, the commerce agreement with Japan in 1957, opening up a flourishing relationship, mm. at least in those years, at an economic level. What was it about Japan that made it easier to develop that relationship? There's a couple Menzies? of things about that. And that didn't happen with India. The historians have got a bit to say about this and one of the theories or one of the, I don't think it's a theory, I think it's fairly evidence-based from the archives of the 1957 treaty is that it was led by John McEwen. Yes. And he was led by John Crawford who was head of Treasury, who was a hugely significant Australian diplomat. There must be biographies of him somewhere. And that John McEwen led the way with the 1957 trade treaty. And Peter Edwards, who was at your day recently, He's talked a lot about this too, that John McEwen was the one that pushed and pushed and pushed for the trade treaty. And there is some archival evidence that Menzies was touch and go about it. He knew that it could create enormous domestic flack. He was very worried about that. In fact, there's one story that I think is in Peter Edwards's book where he says that Menzies didn't actually attend the cabinet meeting where they approved the Japanese treaty because he thought he'd have a way out that if it all went pear-shaped, he'd say, oh, well, I wasn't even there and if it was a great success. Well, I think John McEwen actually says to Menzies when things are getting difficult, look, I'll take this. Yes. I'll own this so that if it it becomes too difficult, you can blame me. But Menzies did go to the signing. Yes. He went to Japan. So, I mean, it was his government. He was the boss. Yeah. Yeah. You can't sort of just say it had nothing to do with him. But there were other very strong voices around him who clearly he was persuaded by. Now, John McEwen was Minister for Trade and John Crawford was the Department of Trade. Maybe their voices were stronger than the voices that were coming out of external affairs because India seemed to be run, the diplomatic side, out of external affairs. Right. Japan was run out of the Department of Trade. So it's a fascinating insight into the role, which my great love, the role of diplomats and the role of the people behind the scenes. But also the role of leaders because well, Japan wasn't part of the British Empire. It no. hadn't been a, a no. British colony. It had obviously been occupied by the United States post-World War II, but there wasn't that legacy of empire, legacy of colonialism. No. maybe that helped. And their leaders didn't necessarily look at British system as or the British experience as a negative because they didn't have it. So when Menzies and Japanese leaders were coming together, there obviously wasn't that background. And, and there may well be something about a purely economic agenda that is easier to navigate than the complexities of the Cold War and white Australia policy and legacy of empire and the security pacts that were being signed, ANZUS and CETO. But it was quite a layered world and the foreign affairs, external affairs as it was then, had some very, very prominent Arthur Tang and diplomats who were very outspoken, very pro-Asian. Now, look, it may well be that in trade they didn't buy into any of that sort of politics and they just said, we need a trade treaty, we need economic relationships. This is the Australian economy and let's go for it. The other thing about ANZUS and the Colombo Plan was that there's also a lot of historical record about the fact that Percy Spender drove that, both Mm. of those, and it wasn't Menzies. Percy Spender also made the decision, I think, to send Australian forces to Korea. I think the story about that was that Menzies was on the high seas. He was, yes, and when finding out that the British were going to commit troops to Korea, Spender said, well, okay, we've got to He was an interesting guy, Spender, who who got got sort of pushed out of the way way too early. Well, I guess he got pushed off to Washington, which isn't bad. So it's interesting, though, because I think looking at those 
what are today two extremely important relationships for Australia in Asia with India and Japan, how they've developed differently. And the relationship with Japan is so very close now, not just economically, but in terms of people to people links and at a security mm. dimension as well. And recently we've signed really amounts to a sort of quasi alliance with Japan. But we are both part of the quad with the United States. Um, so India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. So our alignment on strategic issues is there with India, not on all. And of course, on Russia, we have a difference of opinion. But economically, it's still very thin with India. And I mean, that goes down to the way they've managed their economy and their difficulties of their federal system, much more difficult than ours, evidently. But we are seeing that development of people to people links, which is fascinating. So as I understand it now, when you look at migrants in Australia, Indian migrants are number two after British. Yes. I mean, that is quite a dramatic change in not very many years, is it? Yeah, there was something like I read the other day, there's something like 156,000 people of Indian ancestry is the way it's, so that's Indian people. And then in 2001, now in 2022, there are nearly 800,000. Amazing. So it's just skyrocketed. Amazing. And and they're coming in at some quite senior levels of government and law and medicine. So my question is, Meg, since Menzies, Who's changed? Has Australia changed that much or yes. has India changed that much? Because India has a very different leader these days, Prime Minister Modi. I think Australia's changed enormously, enormously. And I think that from 1949 to 1972, I think we were a little bit stuck. I was a child of Menzies. I grew up in a household in East Malvern where my parents wouldn't have been able to have contemplated anybody voting for anybody other than Menzies. We're sort of like, oh, couldn't do that. So I grew up surrounded by the sort of the what I call the imagery and idiom of empire. I knew all about the Menzies world. But then I was in my sort of late teens, early 20s during Whitlam's time and I can actually still feel the change, the difference that it made. And then coming back as a student and as a scholar and studying Whitlam's speeches and I thought, wow, he really did change things or set out to change things enormously. So I think from that moment on, Australia has sort of been galloping down a path of change that's very, it's managed and it's manageable, but it's definitely productive and good. And I don't know about India. I mean, the thing about India and Japan is that maybe they're just very, very different countries and maybe the Japanese, are, I don't know enough about Japan to comment really. But maybe Japan is better at just keeping things close to the... I mean, Indians are fairly noisy and vibrant and vigorous and their debates are huge and I don't know, maybe there's something in that. One of Australia's... Very- I think that experience of it being part of the British Empire is clearly determinative here of the different reactions to relations with Australia. Like the Japanese just didn't have that no. legacy. But both are very proud Asian countries, very proud of their own culture very independent in that respect. Yes, very strong. Peter Varghese, who was Australia's High Commissioner, who you would know, 2009, I think he arrived in India. Such an eloquent, talented guy. And he gave this wonderful speech not long ago where he said when he arrived in India in 2009, he was absolutely bowled over to find that so many Indians in very senior – well, it was a bit like what I was saying about my experience – very senior positions, still believe that Australia had a restrictive immigration policy. And he said, I had to tell them that it had gone in the 60s and 70s and since then Australia is this extremely successful multicultural, multiracial country. And they didn't know. And he said, it was almost like I had to go back to base one. So somehow or other, Australia, I don't think, maybe we haven't been good enough. I know this is a line of another former High Commissioner, John McCarthy. It's a line of John McCarthy, John's, that... We're not very good at promoting soft diplomacy. Which is strange because we have some wonderful cultural links with India yes. in terms of cric- love of cricket. I mean, sport diplomacy is, is a big thing. Yes. You'd think that there would have been And more so is academics. There's, I mean, yeah. there's academic conferences all the time. There's a lot of intellectual connections. So that's what I think probably been the biggest change in the last 20 years is the people-to-people links and the, the role of the diaspora. I mean, Australians have always gone to India. They went as backpackers first. They went as people sort of trying to find some spiritual meaning to their lives or all sorts of reasons that people roamed around India. So it's not as if Australia and India have been strangers to each other, but somehow at the official level it's taken a long while and maybe it's the quad that's going to sort of 
But it's interesting it with world. Japan, Australia developed the economic relationship first and then the people-to-people links and finally security, the strategic relationship developed. Whereas with India, we've sort of flipped it. It seems to be we're developing people-to-people links, so with these huge waves of Indian mm. migration to Australia and security links are very much important now. And you feel like the economic side might just follow one day. But we aren't on India's radar as much as we would like to think we are. And I think that we find that when you go to the United States, to China, to these big powers, we think about them a lot more than they think about us. Yeah. (laughs) I think that's always been the case with India. And David Brewster from the ANU Security College has got a lovely term. He says that Australia's always been strategically inconsequential (laughs) to India. When I heard that, I thought, yes, that's exactly what it is. That even during all those years of when people like Arthur Tang and subsequent diplomats were trying to argue the case for what Australia was doing in the foreign policy area, in a way, if you look at where India is and look at its geography, Pakistan, China, the Middle East, Bangladesh, all these countries around it, you can sort of see why Australia is inconsequential to it. Gareth Evans once said to me when I interviewed him for my book, he said the problem with Australia and India, I thought this was really kind of like an epiphany for me. He said, we've never created particular problems for India. He said they love grouching about white Australia and being a lackey of the United States. He said, but that hasn't created necessarily problems for India in its day-to-day management of its policies and politics. And he said, but nor have we presented solutions. He said, so we sort of missed out. But there's something about Australia, clearly, given the numbers of Indians who have migrated here, that is attractive. So despite all the grouchiness about legacy of white Australia and come at the world from different perspectives, we're close to the United States, they haven't been traditionally close to the United States. They still want to come here. Indian people still love living in Australia. They see this as a place of great opportunity and, and Yes, it doesn't and translate to the antipathy that you come across at senior levels. Yeah. You don't come across with people-to-people links and at all. And the same can be said of China too yes. as well. Yeah. That the everyday Chinese People like Australia. Person, right? Yeah, it finds Australia appealing, yeah. wants to come here, wants to send their children yeah. here to university. But, of course, at that elite senior government-to-government level, we have intractical problems. But is China part of one of the reasons why we've got closer to. I mean, China is a huge issue for India, a territorial dispute, 1962 issues, the border war, and on it goes. I mean, even just in recent years, there are horrible images of PLA fighting right up in these And throwing Indian soldiers off off cliffs. It was awful. Is China part of the reason why we've been drawn together? No doubt. No doubt. And the Quad is all about containing China. Well, containing a, a response to China. Interestingly, I read some stuff in the archives the other day. The Quad was first mentioned in 1963. Walt Rostow, who was a national security advisor to, in the Kennedy administration, and I think he went on to be the national security advisor to LBJ. But Walt Rostow said to the Australian ambassador to Washington, Howard Beale, he said, oh, there's quite a bit of talk around about a collaboration between Australia, India, Japan and the United States because this was just following the 1962 war with China and India. So this was 1963, just before Kennedy got assassinated. And he said, do something about the spread of communist China. Everybody in those days always said communist China. was yes. China was always yeah. the spread of communist China. So it was first mentioned in 1963 when Arthur Tang went there in 65 to 70 He also said there's this talk about a grouping of Australia, Japan, India and the United States, but no one seems to know, you hear about it, but then when you push it, no one seems to know what on earth anybody means. So it never actually happened until now. Now, what I feel about the Quad is, I mean, the Quad has a lot of critics amongst the people in the foreign policy space, as everybody's talking about these days. It also has its supporters. But I think my own take on it is it doesn't matter why it was started. It can be maybe a catalyst in 10 years' time for some wonderful things between those four countries. I think uniquely flexible too. The fact that the Quad has been able to work through India's different position on Russia, for example, yes. and the invasion of Ukraine, while still keeping together a united position on concerns around China, is extraordinary. It's not a zero-sum game with the Quad like other arrangements might be. So I think with that level of flexibility, you are able to see something that could be quite interesting and sustained and develop into some 
meaningful And there seems approaches. to be a level of commitment mm. there mm. that mm. I don't think I've witnessed before in a little Whether life. that changes when Modi eventually leaves office, it will be interesting to observe. There's certainly been continuity in Australia and the US and Japan on the quote over the last five or so years. But yeah, we haven't seen a change in leadership in India. So no, that will come. No. And India also, as you say, it's also connected. It gets all of its arms from Russia. It's not going to chop off its arms deals overnight. But it also belongs to this Shanghai cooperation, which has got a leadership of China and Russia. India paddles its own canoe. It always has it used to be called non-alignment, it's now called strategic autonomy and they don't like being bossed around by anybody. But there is a very, I've noticed over the years talking to Indian foreign policy people, they're profoundly, got to get the right word, sceptical, suspicious of China. And it's not just what's going up on the border, that's sort of symbolic, but the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and building bases at competition for power, naval military power in the Indian Ocean, there's a lot there. So I think India is quite good at hedging. I think it's hedged with the quad and good things might come out of it. I mean, it hasn't done much yet other than talk, but... You've got to start with talk yes. though, don't you? Yeah. You've got to start somewhere. Well, Meg, this has been a fascinating discussion on Australia-India and I think a really important one too because most people would appreciate where we are today, but it's come from quite a different place. Yes. and we've come a long way. We have come a long way. And we're so very influenced by our history. And while there's so much that actually unites us in terms of the Westminster system, the sports we love, the languages we speak and the people-to-people links these days, there's a lot that is very different and it's important to appreciate both of those and hopefully build on positive trajectory we're on now. So thank you very much, Meg Gurry, for joining me on Afternoon Light. Well, thank you for having me, Georgina. The Afternoon Light podcast is brought to you by the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. You can find more about the Institute and our podcast at robertmenziesinstitute.org.au. We're also on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. We look forward to you joining our show next week. Thank you.